All right, so the format's going to kind of be if you have just a question, just a general question about anything, uh, that's what they're here for. It can be about anything we've already talked about, it can be something that we haven't talked about. Um, we'll keep it healthcare related and avoid religion and politics. And that's all right. <laughs> um, but if you do, raise your hand, I'll come to you and uh, ask a question for you. So just tell me what it is. What's that? Does anybody have any questions? Raise your hand, you say. All right, okay, I'll come right over there. Let's see. You okay? Yeah. Okay. Just say hello. Uh, Marty, what does what your day look like? All right, so the question, Marty, what does your day look like? You want Monday or you want Thursday? <laughs> <laughs> Monday. Monday, okay, the hard one. I don't like to talk about Monday. Uh, honestly, I personally, I'm not on top of my best game on Mondays, and I know that about myself. So Mondays, I have to work, give myself some grace, and also when I set up my calendar for the week, I try not to overload Mondays. I look for the open spots on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, because I know that Monday is going to involve um, possibly twice the amount of post-hospital discharges. Uh, fortunately, we have one care manager in our clinic who does 99.9% .9 of the discharge calls, but anything in there that's complicated gets turfed to myself or my coworker Patricia. We basically, uh, Patricia and I, we kind of split the clinic. Uh, pediatrics doesn't really get very much because they don't ask very much and don't need very much. Um, and there was three doctors for each of us. So Monday may involve extra chart reviews. Uh, Monday always, like every other day, starts with open up the schedule and look at the schedule for each of the doctors that I work with and scan that for people that I know. If I hadn't been there for a while, I wouldn't know who I need to know. But I'm coming up on my fourth year in that clinic, so uh, I kind of know my patient population. And I know most of the population of each doctor's panel that are high risk by this time. So I'm scanning for those patients. And um, I work heavily off of my Outlook calendar. That's my go-to. And it's kind of the point of intersection between the follow-ups that I need to talk to the doctor about. And I'll start the day off with trying to make sure that I am present at the doctor's pod sometime between 8 and 15 in the morning that's the best time to get started on who needs what this morning. That's just to start. Um, there's a part of putting out fires. Has that your provider asked you to be there during that time or is that something you just figured out and it works or? That's just what I figured out works. Um, trying to learn their style and when they're available. Not every physician is as willing as another one to be interrupted between <coughs> patients and so you kind of have to learn to navigate. Is this somebody that I need to interrupt him between patients about, or is this something that can wait until midtime, or is this something that can wait until tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock? Uh, so that, that level of triage in my cases does come into play. I'm sorry, what was your patient panel and your doctors? Your, how many doctors do you have, and how many, how many uh, care managers do you have? We have three care managers. We have six family practice physicians and patient panel of about 9,000. Thank you. Anybody else have anything that maybe where one day looks different than the rest based on kind of how you do things or, go ahead, somebody can? Um, I have several um, providers that have half days, so I try to kind of work my schedule around there because if they're all in clinic, um, I have those <laughs> a lot busier when they're all there um, with patients. So I tend to, on their half days, schedule my nursing visits and a heavier day for me. Anybody else? So my geriatric uh, nurse practitioner, she has facility days where she is out for a day and a half. So um, Wednesday afternoons and all day Thursdays, and so those days are actually pretty interesting for me because I'm fielding texts and calls from her in the facility. I'm sitting in the office. She doesn't have Epic anywhere where she's at, right? So she's 
having me give her information she needs to try to reconcile something with the facility patient, um, which is very interesting, including give me the medical records. Did they not send that? Um, I didn't know this patient was discharged. They didn't tell me she was admitted. So, it, you know, it's interesting. And so on those days, you would think I would be less busy. I'm actually not. So I try to schedule my appointment times when the patients, when my providers are actually there versus not. Because when they're not, usually it's because Amy's out in facilities, and that's a busy time. Does anybody else have any questions? Other topics? Okay, I have a question about your huddles. Are you doing, it sounds like you did a great job with your pre-visit planning and you provide your providers, you give your providers um, documents that shows who's coming in, what they need, what are their gaps in care. Um, are you also holding huddles? And if so, what type of topics are you covering in huddle and do you feel like that's effective? I think I can answer this one maybe the way you're asking it. Um, the huddles, we, Janet and I, Janet is the care coordinator with me in our clinic, and we try to go around, our, our, our different pods have their huddles, they go over who their patients are, and if there's a high risk patient or one that's um, not being engaged in their own health care, they will point it out to us or if we see one that's coming in or we've scheduled with a doctor, we let them know, hey, we'd like to see this patient when the doctor's finished. And but first and foremost, we go around to see our providers and, and our nurses and our MAs because we just like to know what kind of demeanor they're in that morning. Because, you know, if your scheduler doesn't show up or or your MA's having a bad day, or you have a flow with the doctor that sees 40 patients plus, you know, 10, you know, add-ons that day, you're gonna understand what stress level each of those providers are gonna be in. So you know which ones to ask the questions. You may not wanna ask them at noon. You may not wanna ask them until the next day unless it's, you know, an emergent thing or just send them a task, but that's, I mean, when we do what we call huddles, we just, we like to let them know, hey, we're here, I noticed this one, or even if you're gonna have a pediatric or an autistic um, kiddo that I, I see that they're due for a blood draw, um, we'll be more than happy to help you, or, you know. Does that answer your question? I think so. Do, do you have a hard time getting people engaged in huddles? No, but I mean, I come, I, I'm really spoiled so compared to the rest of my care managers because I, I worked in a hospital for 20 years where my providers were also, they took care of their patients in the hospital. So I already had that rapport, that trust with my <coughs> providers. So if I told them this patient's going south, they knew, oh, well, maybe Gina should see them. Is it typically just you and the provider in the huddle, or are there other people involved? So. The, the MAs, the, um, we, Janet and I call all of our ERs, we call all of our um, uh, admissions that are discharges from the hospital. So we already know if they have a, what kind of clarity they have with their discharge instructions, or, and, and we make sure that they're followed up. You know, they, the hospital might have a follow up in a week, which is seven to ten days, which is great. But for that patient that's taken aspirin instead of Plavix after he got a stent because he wanted to save money, we're going to go ahead and get him in either that afternoon or that morning, and you know, so he doesn't have to be rescinded. So. Hey, when, when you're doing that huddle, are you going through patients that are like on the list on a through your previous planning sheets or just on the schedule of EPIC or how, how are you decide who to talk about? Well, we go, we do our previous planning on everyone. We give the sheets, we highlight whatever that is pertinent. They, all of our MAs, LPNs, nurses, they look at those sheets to make sure they're not going to miss the gap in care. And the ones that we stress about are that new onset STEMI, the new onset diabetic, the Exacerbation COPD, CHF, um, the ones just, the free, I shouldn't say free requires, but the ones that are going back to the ER or because, you know, they're 
they need diuresis. Or here lately, it seems like it's been a strand of hyperemesis because they're, you know, 16 weeks along and they don't realize you can come into the clinic to have IV fluids. It, it, it's okay. And uh, just simple things like that, they just don't know. But when we see that the higher risk, that's where we talk to the MAs. Or if the MAs see something that we don't, or the LPNs, they, I mean, like we just, we really try to develop that rapport with, with the nursing staff, with the providers. It just, it just works better that way. Does anybody else have uh, big needs for team huddle wise, something you do that works well or doesn't work well? We haven't been able to get huddles down, really. I mean, like a real huddle. But I do try to go by um, each one of my providers in the mornings, like kind of just check out the waters. Um, when I do pre visit planning the day before and I'm printing my pre visit summaries, I'll put notes on there, um, like uh, see Robin, please, or um, you know, I'll just put certain notes on there, like, or I've been working with this patient about trying to get her, we have retina view. Um, cameras in our offices and we take eye pictures and so if I've been working with a patient <coughs> trying to get that done I'll put that note on the, on the pre-visit summary so they're kind of used to and, and the inmates are real good about coming <coughs> in me and so that's kind of our makeshift hub because we, we have doctors starting at 7 30, 8, 9 30, 10 so it's kind of hard you know so that's how we do it. That's how I do it with my previous summaries. Any other questions about team huddles specifically? Do you guys have any advice on dealing with the more challenging providers or the providers that maybe aren't as engaged? Any thoughts or stories or not about me? But <laughs> I've had one provider that I've really struggled with, and um, I think just getting over the, I mean, every, I struggle with going back to, to talk with them, but when I do, I always, I, I just have to make myself go back there, but when I do, it's like, and it is, like Stephanie said, it's how you, how you approach them, and um, so, you know, if you just make it like it's their idea and just ask questions, like, and just put your ideas in your question, but just say, what do you think about that? I mean, this provider has always been, I mean, he's never bit my head off. Um, so, anyway, that's how I do it with, with mine. Anybody else? I think it's just time if they just continue to see you and um, confidence. You know, just continuing to keep plowing forward, you will finally get there with that particular provider. Um, it just takes time and just keep, is there anything I can do? Is there anything I can do? And eventually they will say, yes, do this, and just confidence. You know, we asked Dr. Gallus one time when we were having a big pushback from a lot of um, providers, and and his response was, this is your job to talk to patients. We have these standing orders, just, just see them. And even though I had a good rapport with my providers and my internal medicine, I won't mention any high tower names, but he <laughs> takes care of his patients. I mean, and he, you know, he, he doesn't like standing orders. He wants to do, he's very much a micromanager and a very good one at that, but why are you seeing my patient? And I had been seeing one, and um, a diabetic who I, I knew from the hospital, and I knew that why his engagement wasn't coming through. So when Dr. Hightower got to see an A1C of 12 go to six in three months, he wanted to know, man, I'm really doing a good job. I said, yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> so when he did his follow up with the patient, he was like, yeah, Gina, Gina and Janet, they were, you know, calling me every week, I'm coming in there, and you know, he's so busy, and we don't have an office person, so when the patient would come
I mean, we'd bring him over on Dr. Grellner's side and talk to him, yes, <laughs> however you want to look at that. We were looking at it as patient engagement and doing the best for the patient. But the patient was actually the one that got to tell, you know, oh yeah, Gina, Gina, they're really, you know, yeah, they, they've kind of been on me about, you know, and I didn't realize, you know, what a car was or why, you know, this wasn't, and if it was really necessary that I check my sugar, you know, every time I took my fast acting insulin, and, you know, it was just, I don't know, that's how we've kind of, I mean, we, we want to be respectful towards our providers, but we want to do our job also, and sometimes that's how you have to look at it. Um, you know, and, and Dr. Hightower wasn't upset with us, but well, why didn't you tell me you were seeing my patient? Well, because I don't have to ask you, you know, I'm doing my job. But, you know, if you don't want me to see any of your patients, let me know and I, we won't see them. But I've never got instructions as don't see my patient. So, just a little bit there. If I can be a little bit philosophical and touch on what Gina said, what she's, I think, demonstrating is a, a leadership style that is uh, part of Bell's family systems theory, and that is the here I stand leadership. And that's taking stock of who I am, what I know, what I believe, and what I'm going to do, and say, here I stand. And this is my stance until I have better information that is adequate to change my position. From that position as a professional, I engage the patient. And I do it um, basically as an act of service. The question about what's my Monday morning look like? My first year as a care manager uh, seemed like Monday morning Groundhog Day. Ever seen the movie Groundhog Day? Yeah, you all know what I'm talking about. That was my first year um, because I was the float care manager and I covered five different clinics in Tulsa in that year and some of them two at a time or three at a time. And there was a lot of resistance in some of them and a little bit of resistance in others and a welcoming open door in, in others. And so I had this whole gamut of people and I, I walked into, I won't name the clinic or the doctor, but I walked into a clinic one morning, I was the second or third care manager that had shown up at that clinic in the first year of the CPC I process. And one physician kind of looked at me and kind of sighed and said, so you're the new one. What can I do for you? And I just looked her straight back in the eye and said, no, what can I do for you? And that was a team connecting thing. And it turned the picture. And so I could just show up and say, this is what I have. Here's my toolbox. And I'm on your team to help your patient population. And that, that changed the attitudes really quick. So I think that here I stand leadership position is very valuable when you offer it as a service. And it builds mutuality. And it does more than anything else that I can think of. I'll tell you something about Marty real quick. When I first started in 2014, we had weekly meetings which kept me sane. And they were on Friday. And I came in on Friday. And I was still fairly new within the first two months of being employed, 30 days of orientation, and I was out in the clinic, and Marty said, so Amy, how's it going? I said, well, you know, it's kind of, it's just going. And he says, it kind of like drinking water from a fire hydrant. And I said, well, yes. And he goes, well, you're going to feel that way for at least four months. And I said, great. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that you hang in there and know that that's exactly how everybody else feels, too. Um, I. I can vouch for Marty, at least the first year, you're scrambling, putting out fires, and it's my day every day, as far as we were concerned. Any other questions? Can I make one more comment? Yes. And uh, I'm just going to follow what both Amy and Marty said. They talked about Fridays. We've talked about Fridays. One of the, I'm going to stand up so you guys can hear me. So every Friday for probably two years, we met every Friday, and we ended up being more like this support group. Felicia just mentioned a little bit ago, we wanted to find a way to call, connect care managers more so they can share and talk about what happened. I will tell you that was probably our surviving tool was a, was a Friday meetings. And I remember, and I don't remember which care manager it was, but they were like, oh my gosh, this is happening, that is happening, what am I gonna do? How many people felt like that maybe yesterday? Or last week, okay? And I, I clearly remember one of our peer managers said, okay, give it two months. 
a um, couple visits into it, I don't know, I took care of him for a couple of months, Stephanie visits my office, she's like, oh, you see this patient? I said, yes. She said, I did too. And so I made mention of it. I said, anything I need to know? She's like, no, it's cool, you know, and she's like, so, okay. He comes back in, I said, guess who I saw? He said, who? And I saw Stephanie from Sand Springs, and he goes, oh, Stephanie, Stephanie, let me tell you, she was the reason four years ago that I actually started checking my blood sugars. And I cared about why I ate the way I ate, and I actually started to open up to people. It was thanks to Stephanie at the time, and now I get to share the joy with this patient because he's fabulous. I'm just here to tell you. I see him every two weeks, probably, depending on how well he's doing, but he's fabulous. He's fabulous. Yeah, so uh, the uh, slide that's put there is something that gets talked about frequently. Uh, kind of three different classes and what, what's uh, going with relationship building, and, uh, which is what we've kind of been talking about the last few minutes. But then, you know, the plan, some of it's planned, some of it's predictable, and some of it's fighting fires. So we'll come back to that in just a minute. Let me get this question. What were you going to ask? Okay. So the question is, how do you handle Medicare wellness visits? Are you guys doing much on that? Or? Um, I'll start out by saying Cushing is leading in Medicare wellness visits with you in part. But clinics, by the way. But how we do that when we do our pre-visit planning, we have schedulers for each of our pods. And just on a sticky note, I write down this patient needs a Medicare wellness schedule. And my scheduler will give that patient the Medicare wellness paperwork to fill out, and we're, we schedule them the next week. If they have questions about it, Janet or I will go visit with them and help them understand um, what a wellness visit is, why we're doing it. And um, we, we haven't had very much pushback, you know. They'll want to know, well, why can't we do it today? Well, because this is a time. This is a longer slot for you to sit and visit with your doctor about things. You, you came in with a sore throat, you came in with a flu today. He doesn't want to, um, or she, um, there's a lot of things that's covered here in Medicare Wellness, you know, and I'll start rattling off half of what's in the Medicare Wellness. And I said, we didn't want to overwhelm you with this visit. We want you to come in when you feel better, when you can, um, talk to us about everything that's addressed in this. Go ahead and fill out your paperwork, bring it back next week, and, and we'll go over it. And that's, you know, those that don't want to come in or are in our impoundment but we haven't seen, we we call and try to get them in. Um, and usually they'll come in even if they've never seen the provider um, for a wellness visit. And, but sometimes we, you know, those are those ones that we don't have a working number on <coughs> that address, you know. So how many are you doing a week? The question is, how many Medicare wellness visits are you doing a week? Um, I don't know how many. I would say uh, a week. Our, our goal is what, 80 percent, more up to 70 percent of our patients that have been completed. Over so, the course of the year. Yeah. So I mean, if if Dr. Bromler, he has a nurse practitioner, if Dr. Bromler's schedule is full and I and I have given Beth as a scheduler, um, I've got these seven Medicare wellness that need to be done, she'll load Courtney up with, I mean, she may not do anything but Medicare wellness all day long. Oh, okay, so you're not doing anything? No. You hear me the No, the provider. That's nice, because we do. So, so the question is, he was asking, if any of these care managers do the Medicare wellness business themselves, and the answer is no. But you're saying you actually do the Medicare wellness business. How many other care managers actually do the Medicare wellness business in here? Okay. Like you. Oh, good. Just a couple. Just a couple of comments. We have had. I mean, tell you guys honestly, you want to know how to help those providers? You said, let me help you with your provide with your Medicare wellness visit. Stephanie Gutierrez back here at the back. That was her foot in the door with her provider. It was something that he hated, hated with capital H, and it's required, and she said, let me help you with this. 
And it, that was her way to build that relationship that I can help you with these things. There were some things that she did, there were some things the MA did, and there were some things that the provider did. So they worked out that little workforce to do themselves. Another thing I'll just tell you about Medicare wellness visits is check your, your June through August schedules. That typically tends to be light time during the summer. Yes, your providers are gone, but your patients are traveling as well. So then you can get some of that time filled in when your provider doesn't have all those patients, but they could be maybe a little bit appreciative to keep them a little busy during the summer, but otherwise they might be done at one o'clock or so. So think about how you balance those, those two pieces like that. And we do schedule our Medicare wellness where we attempt to during non-flu season because we, we would hate for a well patient to come in and sit by someone with a flu and then, yeah. That's exactly what I was gonna say. I, I don't like it to be done between November and March for the most part because there's no reason for them to be exposed like that. Marty, I guess your clinic where you said you guys were in second or close to that? I'll speak to Dr. Beeson because he's kind of right up there with his process. And five years ago, he struggled to do his fair share of regular wellness business. But he recognized it as a priority and he decided to use it as the tool to really get a real picture of what's going on with my people, not just a hoop to jump through. And we used the first population data, scoop the big data, see who needs it, and just start working the list and trying to get them scheduled. But since it's an annual thing, they've taken to scheduling that patient. You know, they come in on August the 16th of 2018, and they walk out the door with their visit for August the 19th of 2019. It's, it's scheduled a year ahead of time. So now that he's several years into the process, basically what he did was he looked at how many Medicare patients he had, how many visit slots did he have in a year, and he's carved out um, basically the first two hours of every day 30 minute slots and he will double book uh, minor acutes alongside of those but the first two hours of his day is dedicated to medical wellness so he's commonly doing three to four medical wellness per day every day and his numbers are good his medical wellness visits are taken care of um, his people are getting what they need and it also has bumped up his uh, quality numbers on mammograms and colonoscopies and all that, that followed doing the Medicare. And my role in that is next to nothing at this point. The only thing that I do is if I happen to catch one that needs scheduled, if I schedule it, I make sure that the Medicare wellness questionnaire goes in the mail and gets to the patient before they have to come in for the visit. And my work is out to you that do the Medicare wellness visits because as a nurse, I think, I really think that that needs to be in the, in the scope of the physician rather than a nurse, because it's such a strong communication tool for the patient. So, I have a breakdown, start crying, you know, because they just have issues. But they don't communicate well with the doctors. They're like, here's things you just talk to. I've never told my doctor this. I've never told my wife this. But, you know, it's just like, oh. So there, you're speaking to the nursing value of doing Medicare wellness, where you'll catch things in Medicare wellness that the doctor doesn't. Exactly. So it may be just a clinic by clinic situation. Oh, Always have clinic box. Oh, box. There you go. So there's a lot of variability with Medicare wellness business on how it's done from one system to the next, for sure. And there's a lot of variability in the perceived value of them as well. Uh, I, I can tell you, when I first started doing them, it was, it was a process that I didn't like, uh, I didn't appreciate, Seemed like there's a waste of time for everybody involved. Uh, and as time has shifted, I began to see more and more uh, benefit that's come from that. And of course, I had magic cancer, but I agree. I, I, I like the provider perspective of it because I think there's a lot of things we can do to add to that. Um, but in the end, I think it's better to take care of the patients. So if that's what works in your system and that's what helps get those gaps closed, then um, that's the way it works.